Did you know that Geoffrey Chaucer wrote more than just his famous Canterbury Tales? Stick around to learn more about his life and his lesser known works. Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today we're going to have a look at the medieval English poet and writer Geoffrey Chaucer and focus in on his minor works. Don't forget, the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to our channel so you don't miss out on any new uploads. If you like my sweater, you can get this design and a bunch more in our store at worldhistory.store or you can find the link to it under our merch tab down below. Geoffrey Chaucer was an English poet, writer and philosopher who lived between 1343 and 1400. His father, John Chaucer, was a winemaker and seller and their family would have been fairly wealthy. When Chaucer was 13, he got his first job as a page to the Countess of Ulster, Elizabeth de Burgh. In 1359, Chaucer was a part of an expedition to France in one of the English's offensives during the Hundred Years' War in the hopes that they could take the city of Reims, where the French kings were traditionally crowned, so they could make Edward III king of both England and France. During his time in France, Chaucer was captured and Edward paid £16 for him to be released. Geoffrey Chaucer didn't make his living as a writer, since publishing as we know it wasn't even a thing yet, but he was held in high esteem as a poet by his noble patrons. He knew many languages, including English, French, Latin and Italian. He translated a number of different works and established Middle English as a respectable language to compose literature in during the medieval period rather than the traditional French and Latin. We have much to thank Geoffrey Chaucer for, including the English words amble, bribe, femininity, plumage and Twitter, the rhyming stanza called the Rhyme Royale, and his most popular work, The Canterbury Tales. If you've heard of Geoffrey Chaucer, it's probably because of The Canterbury Tales, which is a poem relating the tale of a group of pilgrims who tell each other stories to pass the time on their journey to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket in Canterbury. The work gives us a great snapshot of medieval life, since the characters all come from different social standings. Enough about The Canterbury Tales though, as they are justly famous. Today, we're going to have a look at his lesser known but equally brilliant works, which are often referred to as his minor poems. These minor poems include The Book of the Duchess, The House of Fame, Annalida and Archite, The Parliament of the Fowls, Troilus and Cressida, and The Legend of Good Women, which doesn't survive in its entirety. Many of these works either popularised a certain motif of medieval literature or set the standard for themes or concepts which continued in use throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Let's start off with Chaucer's first work, The Book of the Duchess. The Book of the Duchess was written in around 1370 for his friend John of Gaunt, who had lost his wife Blanche the Duchess of Lancaster, at just 26 years old, most likely to the plague. The Book of the Duchess deals with the grief of loss through death and awakens empathy in an audience for that loss, while also prompting the question of whether it is worse to lose a loved one to death or to unfaithfulness. The Book of the Duchess is the epitome of the literary motif known as the dream vision, which opens the action with the narrator falling asleep and, through the narrator's dream, reveals knowledge of an issue they're experiencing in life which would not have been recognised whilst they were awake. Then, they wake up, often with a resolution or resigned to the issue at hand, and they promptly write the poem down. The narrator in the book of the Duchess, however, wakes without stating that his problem is resolved and thus offers no resolution for grief other than a compassionate listener in the form of the narrator. The question of whether it is worse to lose a loved one to death or unfaithfulness is left to the poem's audience to answer for themselves.
During his time as a Comptroller of Customs, overseeing exports and regulating taxes at the London Customs House, Chaucer wrote The House of Fame, The Parliament of the Fowls, and Troilus and Cressida. The House of Fame is another which follows the dream vision motif, however this poem breaks off and isn't finished. In this work, Chaucer as the narrator in his dream is picked up by an eagle with golden wings and taken to the House of Fame, where a woman named Fame, with many eyes, ears and tongues, awards fame and infamy to many people throughout history. Chaucer watches for a while, realising the concept of fame is fleeting and dependent on what others say about you more than your own merits. And then he is taken to a spinning house in a valley, which symbolises how fame is influenced by rumour and gossip. It is this work which popularised the earlier Roman concept that glory is fleeting, a motif used throughout the Middle Ages. Next we have the Parliament of Fowls, which is the first mention of Valentine's Day in literature, with many scholars suggesting Chaucer made up the day specifically in his poem. The Parliament of Fowls also employs the motif of the dream vision, and the narrator falls asleep reading a book in hopes it will help him learn the art of love. He falls asleep and is taken to the Temple of Venus and the court of Mother Nature, who is overseeing the mating of the birds. In the hierarchy of birds, the eagles must first choose their mate before the lesser birds can choose theirs. Three eagles fight over the one female eagle, and when none of them back down, a parliamentary debate is called. Mother Nature moderates until she finally asks the female eagle which of the three she would choose. She says she will have none of them and will wait until the next year to have a mate. After that, the lesser birds are free to choose their mates and sing joyously in celebration of love. The narrator awakes, happy for the birds, but no closer to understanding the nature of love than before. The theme of romantic love follows through to Chaucer's next piece, Troilus and Cressida which is set during the Trojan War, and focuses on the central characters of a Trojan warrior and a Greek maiden. The Trojans and Greeks were at war in this tale, and Troilus, a Trojan, makes fun of love and thinks lovers are foolish. And for this, Cupid strikes him with an arrow, which causes him to fall in love with Cressida, a Greek. Troilus begins courting Cressida, but since he was always so adamant about the foolishness of love, they keep their relationship a secret. When the Greeks capture an important Trojan warrior, Crusader's father, as any father would think to do, suggests they trade the warrior for Crusader, since she was young and unattached to anyone, or so he thought. Troilus can't say anything about their relationship because it's a secret, so Crusader goes to the Greek camp, but swears to him that in 10 days time, she will escape and return to him. This obviously doesn't go as planned, since escaping from a war camp is kind of difficult. Inevitably, Crusader accepts the overtures from Diomedes, one of the greatest Greek warriors, and quickly becomes his lover. Troilus is heartbroken, throws himself into battle, and is killed. As he floats up towards heaven, he looks back on his life and laughs at all the situations he took so seriously. This story, which was so popular that it was later turned into a play by Shakespeare, isn't just about love, but calls attention to what we consider big problems in life, in that Troilus recognises, in the end, that everything he took so seriously was foolishness, and also established the model of the false woman, a female who promises to be faithful but lies, which was also used throughout the medieval period and through the Renaissance in the expression as false as Crusader, in reference to a liar in general, a bad deal, and especially an unfaithful woman. During Chaucer's lifetime, his works were popular. They were written out and copied by scribes, as close as they could come to publishing literary works at that time. And after his death in 1400, his popularity and audience continued to grow. When he died, he was buried in Westminster Abbey, and was the first to be laid to rest in the famous Poets' Corner of the Abbey, where many great writers and poets have been buried and memorialised since. 
In the present day, Geoffrey Chaucer is considered not only the greatest poet of his age, but among the most significant writers in the English language of all time, and is recognised as establishing central literary motifs, plot devices, rhyme schemes, and even English words which would be used by later writers, all of whom owe him a debt of gratitude. Can you think of any pieces of literature that you have read which include any of the motifs or themes that Geoffrey Chaucer introduced or popularised? Let us know down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any new uploads. As always, if you'd like to learn more about Geoffrey Chaucer, his works and medieval literature, you can follow the links down below to our website. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, you can head to our website via the link below. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organisation, so if you'd like to support our work, you can head to our Patreon via the top corner of the screen or via our Patreon link down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.